Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Andrew Turner, founder and host of the g and Sessions podcast. Today we have an amazing guest, Mr. Nir Bashan. Hi, Nir. How are you? Hey, buddy. Good. How are you? Very, very good. I'm flying in the clouds today. I thought I'd have a bit of a break from the beach. So, you know. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Whereabouts are you joining us from today, then? I'm in Orlando, Florida. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I've, I've been there a few times. I've been to, not only to the beach, I've actually been on... Um, the orange is it the orange set orange cut orange county convention center that's right yeah that's the big one right by my house oh is it really all oh, right well wow. yeah because i i was uh, there with sap a few times you know the big tech company from germany so we had a yep. we had like ten thousand twenty thousand people there quite a few times so yeah people don't know that orlando uh, i think at the last last study i saw said that orlando had more hotel rooms than uh las vegas really all oh, right isn't that wild <laughs> Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, so you've got Walt Disney World and everything like that as well. You've got all the cool rides as well. So it's not just yep. about conventions. So That's thank right. you for being on the show today. Um, and I know that you're going to make a little announcement a bit later, but we'll, we'll come to that point in a second. Um, so um, I suppose a quick question is what gets you up in the morning these days? What's, uh, what's going on in Nears, Nears World? So uh, tomorrow we're launching the book, very, very exciting. It's a book called The Creator Mindset, which is seven years in the work <laughs> uh, about how to be more creative at work, no matter what you do. So I'm very excited. That's coming up uh, tomorrow, and it's um, very, very exciting. That's fantastic. So it's like a seven-year itch. Dude, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> it's a seven-year non-itch. Um, it, you know, it's... Um, it's no uh, no easy task to write a book. I don't know, Andrew. Do you, have you tried to write a book? Do you have one out? You, you, you see, this is like I'm supposed to be asking the questions, but you're asking me the questions now. It's quite funny that. No, no. I actually, I actually am working on a book. I'm working on three books actually. Um, one one is a collaboration with other people, and then okay, uh, and then there's a couple of ones that I've actually I've had the book concept a few years. I'm actually um, one of my very good friends is a rock star. And he actually oh, has, nice. he has a publishing company called Rockstar Publishing. So um, yeah, literally he does. It's not, it's not, it's not, so um, he's, he's, he's basically going to help me with, with that kind of couple of the books that I'm, I'm working on. Uh, oh, that's cool. Because obviously, you know, it's, um, it's not bad, you know, not bad, you know, get working with the Rockstar on Rockstar Publishing. It's pretty cool. So um, yeah, but no, I mean, cool. I think, I think writing books and uh, you know, the biggest thing I've written is probably my, uh, dissertation from my from my master's degree which was pretty painful doing the job at Pesco the same yeah so you know you know the uh and then you know you get and I've been very very lucky I've had amazing editors um you know in the in the process uh but it's still you know everybody every word every sentence get combed over and um you know subject to either editorial you know sort of deletion or uh, you know, explain this further. And it, it just, it's, it's a wonderful process, but it's a very involved process. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't honestly can't wait to do it again. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. I, I have another idea for a book about creativity in crisis and how, okay. you know, how creativity tend to be the impetus for innovation when people need it the most kind of like the uh mother of you know necessity of the uh, yeah. yeah so it's that same thing and i'm pretty excited about putting together uh, um, a bit of an outline around what that book could could be mm. so it's exciting we see you've only got you've only got a few months to get that out you see you see seven years for the first book and then obviously, you know, the pandemic's going to be over in a few weeks, isn't it? So you better get the book out quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah. Mean, I've, heard, I've heard till probably till next summer. So you got, you got till, this is, you hit it here first. You got it till next summer to get the book out. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm challenging in here on this one. And then you can, you can challenge me back and say, Andrew, you need to get a book out in 2020, which I am. One of the one. three, Andrew. One of the three. I'm, going to get one, I'm definitely going to get one out this year. I'm definitely going to there get we go. One. Yeah. So, so do, I mean, so, so I suppose that, so the the book he said is called the Creative Mindset. He said Creator yeah. Mindset. Creator Mindset. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah, and it's a McGraw Hill release. It'll be available worldwide on ebook and on um, you know audio book. A lot of people like to listen to books now on audio. Audible, and, yeah, like Audible kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big deal. Um, 
So it's going to be translated into two languages. Uh, it's very exciting. Yeah, it's really about the doing part of creativity, Andrew. There's, you know, when I was looking for a book, uh, I was the consumer of my own book, right? I wanted to find a book on how to become more creative. And right. I read everything on the market. And everything out there that I could find was really around the why. Why should we be more creative? Why should okay. we do why you know and, and and it's a page turner right you're like yeah yeah, yeah you know yeah, where, where, where it gets the goal where it gets the goal yeah exactly yeah yeah and then and then you never get to the how right so it's like mm -hmm. okay i'm in now what do i do and then the book ends and you're like really so we set out to write this thing completely different right so every every page in there is a tool that you can take away there's 92 tools in there and i want what i want to have happen is I want people to to be able to practice creativity like like you practice anything else and um, use it in their day to day lives. So that's what the theory of the book is for. It's about doing. And, and what was the trigger for it? I mean, what's the what, why did you? I mean, you mentioned that obviously there's lots of why books out there, but is is that because you were in a creative field before? What's what's the kind of did you have like an epiphany moment? Like, you know, I, I had a, an epiphany moment for GNC sessions on a, on a plane coming back from San Francisco one, one day, <laughs> back in 2017. Um, but you know, what was the, what was the trigger for it? Did, did, was it just like a, a culmination of different things that came together and you just went ding or what, what was, what happened? You know, a combination of different things came together. Um, I, I started my first business nine at, when I was nine years old, I went door to door washing cards in the, you know, early eighties in Los Angeles. And I noticed that in order to be really good at business, you had to be creative. Why? Because nobody would give us their car keys. Um, Andrew, nobody wanted us to, you know, a couple of nine year old kids and nobody wanted to give us <laughs> their car keys to their it's beloved. Like a, like a joyride or something. Yeah. Totally. You know, they, they had like a shiny, you know, five-year-old Ford Taurus and they didn't want like, you know, some punk kid. So we ended up, you know, my, my friend and I ended up going door to door for, for weeks and we couldn't get one sale. And I, I made the decision really early. I said, you know what, we should do other things. And you know, be of use of value. And so we ended up, you know, cleaning trash cans and people would give us money to clean out because the trash cans were disgusting. Mm. So we ended up cleaning out trash cans and, you know, doing everything from sweeping to, you know, picking up leaves off the front lawn to cleaning dog poop. We did everything. Um, but, you know, what I really learned is that later in life, when I came to run my own companies and other people's firms is that no matter how good the master, you know, master services agreement is, right? You got an MSA that's like that thick and, you know, you spent a lot of money with legal to get it, you know, buttoned up. Yeah. And then now you have a statement of work on top of that, right? And then that statement of work, it just, it's so specific and you staff up for it. And I'm going to, you know, sort of, you know, execute this, this statement of work. Cause that's what, that's our, 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 um, sandbox. Right. Yeah. And never, never in my career, not once have I been able to execute what is exactly in the mass service agreement or exactly in the statement of work and having that flexibility to understand that those things are sometimes you don't get hired to execute your little perfect little thing and the added value that you bring through being creative about mm -hmm. how you deal with a, a customer how you sort of move a product or service forward is far more valuable than what the product or service is in the first place that's what i believe in that that started when I was nine years old through the lens of creativity and every single business that I've had and every single sort of career milestone that I've developed has led me to sort of circling, writing down, cherry picking from different industries where I thought people were creative mm -hmm. and asking them, hey, how did you get creative? And nobody was talking because they felt it was like their IP. So nobody wanted to share. Right. And then at a certain point, I was like, you know what? About six, seven years ago, I was like, you know what? 
if the book doesn't exist, there's obviously a opening in the marketplace. If there's an opening in the marketplace, mm -hmm. I'm going to fill it. And so I did. And so that's kind of where the book came from. It's interesting because it's it, it, what because you're, you're kind of are you saying that the creativity is then around you know your example there where how you make it a memorable experience is that is that you know so being creative to say that you know, like you're back to your you know your car washing days in LA or you're you know <laughs> doing the trash cans or whatever um, you you did it in a memorable way that they would always remember ah it was near. Nia came and did that. Now, is that. Is that what you're saying about the creativity, about the way you engage with the customer? or At every touch point with your customer, okay. Andrew, there's a potential for creativity to be embedded and to grow. Mm -hmm. um, your particular example is very important, right? What was the memorability, The what made you memorable to that customer so mm -hmm. that they remember you later? That's just one of many, right? right. Um, we tweaked our billing model at some point where um, we would do like an a la carte instead of $5 to wash your car and whatever else needed get done. You know, we, we kind of price things out. We would bargain with people. They'd say, oh, I haven't cleaned my yard in two weeks. How many dogs do you have? Three. Uh, yeah, it's going to be like seven bucks, you know, they're all, they're all like, how they're about all five? They're all settle in six. They're all Rottweilers as well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you know, that's, it, it's really, it's really about the flexibility to think differently than everyone else. Right. You know, um, it's not, and I know you're into technology and the software business. I did a, uh, a talk, uh, right before the whole COVID thing, uh, a keynote at a, at a, software for a software group and I literally opened by telling them that most people in that room and most software exists to solve problems that nobody has literally most software exists to solve mm -hmm. problems that nobody had and they were like you know I could hear the mumblings <laughs> around the room they were like oh no who bought this guy in? Yeah, you get, know like get rid of like, the, get load get of this guy the, yeah, get me haul him off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then by the end they were like, you know, really enthusiastic about the message, which was not to do things in isolation, which tends to affect business uh technology business far more than others. Um, sort of that rabbit hole logic of like, oh, we're gonna go down oh, this mean, rabbit hole. You mean a thing like build it and they will come or you don't get out <laughs> you don't you don't get out of the office. Yeah, yeah who's coming? Them. Who? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you go down so far, you've convinced like there's no, a, it's an there's engineering. Here. I can't hear anybody. There's nobody coming. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, it's one of those things that, you know, by the end of the lecture, I was able to, you know, kind of bring everyone around to understand that they need to, to look at every step in their process, their pipeline, right? From development to engineering to testing to QA, all the way to the UX CX, and then see sort of where those moments moments are that you can embed creativity and sort of tweak things around to find so, so a better what, market. So what that triggers with me is, you know, like the, the classic moments of truth with Jan Carlson, remember that? And the Ritz Carlton and the kind yep. of Bass Airlines, you know, like the moments of truth piece where all those kind of interactions were like how you make them, you know, you build the, it builds, it reinforces the brand values, it makes them memorable. Is that, is that another kind of thing you're thinking about as well? Definitely, definitely a tenant of creativity, right? How do you do that? It's going to be different. How you do it, Andrew, in your companies and how I do it in mine is going to be different. Why? Because creativity is as individual as, as human beings are, right? Mm -hmm. it, it literally is something we were all born with, yet as we grow older, we're told to oh that's not serious quiet it down oh you know that you know we we both sat in a class in in kindergarten or whatnot and you drew a pink tree i drew a purple tree and the teacher came by and said andrew you know that is not the color of trees yeah and then you argued with the teacher probably but i was like okay you know <laughs> all right and then i changed the color to the you know proper color of a tree so it, it's one of those things that systematically through our schooling, especially in college, <laughs> uh, especially in grad school, um, we kind of get, and especially in business school, we kind of get. He gets more, dumbed down. He gets dumbed, uh, down. dimmed down, and more and more analytics because it's something we could quote unquote test, and we could um, you know verify. Because if you assign a number to it, all of a sudden it becomes real, right? right. Uh, I'm not so sure, you know. So it, it's one of those things where. You know, I believe that um, 
that creativity, like you're saying, is, is really sort of not only that journey and not only through that pipeline, but also, you know, I get, I do get a lot of people who are resistant to thinking creatively, Andrew, because they think that they're not creative. They're like, I'm not creative. What is this useful? This isn't useful to me. How is it going to be useful? And then I tell them often, I say, listen, how many people have you hired? Thousands. Okay, cool. A uh, hundred. I don't know. Ten. Doesn't really matter. I said, okay, so you looked at resumes and stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, okay, did you find a couple of good resumes? They're like, yeah, obviously, Nair, I hired the people. I said, okay, did this ever happen to you? Have you ever hired somebody and their resume is perfect, right? It's bang on. It's like, oh, this is good. Like, this guy or gal is going to be fantastic in this role. And, you know, and then they start and you hire them and they start and you're like, you know, how did, how did this happen? Look yeah. at their resume, blah, blah, blah. So they're like, oh yeah, it happens all the time. I don't know why it happened. My recruiter is not doing his job or her job, you know, so on and so forth. And I'm like, time out. This is because we are applying analytics to something that needs creativity and analytics will break down somebody's job by where they work last and what they did and so on and so forth. He was, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, but creativity will really give you a sense of that person. Soft skills, it's how they interact, um, you know, how they work under pressure, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when you say, yeah, there's a, at the customer experience point, it's just one of, of, of another several, you know, touch points that you have that you can control no matter mm -hmm. what you do using creativity. So just on that point, I mean, because that's an interesting point about, you know, because there's this, you know, I don't know. I know that the, the McKinsey wrote this kind of article about the war for talent, yeah? But it's actually the, the war for culture. Gaping Void talk about the war for culture. You know, how do you build the right culture? How do you get the right people together? Yeah. How do you build teams effectively? How do you get the right mix? It adds to the brain, the brain trust. What you're raising there is, is actually, on, even on, on hiring and recruiting people, what, what creativity tests that you should really put in place to, to help, you know, organizations map them to the culture as well. Is that, is that another, another topic that you're pulling out as well? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I advise when I, when I consult, I advise people, uh, usually I start in sales because people want, when they bring me on, they want to see, Hey, you know, we paid near this amount. We want to see it back. Right. And, and we want to see a measurable, uh, uh, sort of return on investment, which is fine. Um, and, you know, that's usually where I start. But then sometimes when I could build a longer term relationship, I go into uh, HR, into hiring and firing and that kind of stuff. Um, what I advise people to do is to hire on the person, not on the resume. It sounds so yeah. simple, Andrew, but it's, it's so hard to execute, right? Yeah. It's like one of those things that, you know, in the book, I talk about 92 tools. Every single one of them is free. Every single one of them. Nothing costs you a penny. It's not like you have to go and buy a piece of equipment or, oh, you know, near it's coming in. We're going to have to hire a thousand people and open a new department. And, you know, how are we going to pay for this? It's really about changing your mindset to thinking more creatively. One I've, of the I've, things I've that got, I've, I've got one. I've got one for you, actually. So when, okay. when, I, when I was running Tesco Mobile, I, I, uh, I, I was hiring, I was building my team after we launched the business. And, um, the, the one question I used to ask, and I can't remember the origins of this question, but it was a really good question. What it was was, obviously, Tesco is a retailer, like, you know, Walmart, et cetera, like Target. So what you say is, okay, if you were a, if you were a product on the shelf of the, uh, within a store, what would you be and why? Right? Yeah, that's really good, yeah. So that, but that used to flummox. Some people would actually go, oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'd be completely, they'd be completely, oh, I don't know. Uh, but some people would be like, like that, you know, like that, just really creative, really, you know, like people would say, I'm a pepper, you know, and all, all these different, you know, these different kind of really kind of food things, product things, everything like that. It was really, really quite interesting. Um, but that, that was what was just triggered me when you were just talking about your, your hiring piece as well. It's quite very interesting. Yeah, that's a brilliant, I mean, this is a really great, uh, you mentioned a very good and actionable tool, right? I, I'm, 
all about actionable tools these days. It's crazy, Andrew. Like, I uh, used to be, oh, well, we got to give people the theory. You know what? People are too busy. Let's give them an actionable item. When you're in an interview, ask them that question. That's a brilliant thing. Like, that's something a listener can do right now. You know, they're, they're listening to this podcast. They're on their way to a Zoom meeting. I don't know, maybe an in-person. Who knows? And they're, oh, I'm about to hire this person. Yes, Andrew hooked me up with a good question, right? So, so that's a good one. Brilliant. The other thing that I like is um, hiring on on really um, sort of an unlinear path, right? So when you get a resume, it, it has, you know, three or four jobs, you're looking for a progression in rank, and then you're opening. Um, but sometimes, you know, project managers make really good, you know, uh, um, sort of engineer leads. And sometimes the engineering team leads make really good creative liaisons mm. and so on and so forth. It's not really about looking at sort of that stack. It's about the the conversation. And um, it's about the person. The other thing that I really like is conversation. So you're able to, to talk and get an idea of somebody kind of off the record before we start, you know, that kind of thing, um, I think helps tremendously. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying is, is basically their social skills, their social interaction skills, and can they actually hold a conversation? Um, or are they kind of a bit stilted? You know, they kind of, can, they, can they kind of play with you yeah, a little bit? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so I suppose, I mean, what, so the, obviously you, you launched this book tomorrow, which I mean, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's like, it's, it's an honor to be, be on, the, on the show with you today with ahead of your first book. It's brilliant. Fantastic. And you've now, you, you're now kicking me up my proverbial to, uh, to get my book out now. And then I, obviously you can have, I'm going to have to come on your show then and later on when you've got your own podcast. Um, yeah. But then in terms of, I suppose, in terms of the other projects you're working on, is, is that, is, I presume that's been quite all-consuming all for, for quite a long time. What else, what, what else do you do in your, in your world? What else do you, what else do, you do on, on a daily basis? So I keynote um, and I do presentations on creativity, uh, different industries and different associations across the country. I also do um, consulting. I do consulting work where I embed myself into a corporation and I help um, I help figure out what's wrong and how we can do better. Uh, sometimes it's a very niche sliver of the business. Sometimes, you know, I work with a small business and it's everything. Everything's on the table. Help us figure out, you know, why we're stuck, why we haven't grown. Um, generally, I get called in when uh, on a small business when, um, you know, it's been this way for, you know, six, seven years. We've mm -hmm. developed a certain rhythm and a routine and we're not getting to the next stage. We have one, two, 300 employees. We can't get to the next stage. What's wrong? Mm -hmm. So I get called in for that. Uh, I get called in in a larger, like a fortune five or 100, usually to fix a certain department or a certain problem. All I right. get uh, very, very laser focused uh, there. I get uh, sales, uh, not, uh, sales teams aren't communicating, fix it creatively. Okay, mm -hmm. what's the problem? Northeast isn't talking to the Southwest. The regions are splintered. We sh we're the same company. Near to, uh, help us, please figure out what's going on. That type of, of, of work. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of my in-person keynotes have moved online. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's a pretty interesting and different realm. Um, but it can be very, very exciting to help people remotely. You, you kind of, you're mm -hmm. able to touch people in a different way when they're at home than yeah. in a conference after they got on a plane and, you know, they're, they're kind of hurrying to the, to the hall to see a speaker and then they're hurrying back to a breakout room and then their stuff is still with them. They, they got to drop it off in the room before a dinner, so on and so forth. It's a, it's a bit of a different mindset when, you know, you're at home uh, listening to somebody communicate and educate around creativity. So I've been enjoying that a lot. You can be like that active listening. I suppose it's that active listening. To, I mean, that's what I'm doing with you today. And it's also, I think it's very important because otherwise you don't learn. You don't, you don't, you don't absorb the, the insights and you miss yep. it. Yeah, it's really different. You know, um, I, I'm sure the literature will come out in the next, you know, five or 10 years and we'll learn a lot, right? We'll learn exactly why, you know, go to meetings have been working exactly why the level of play in the premiership has gone way down when there's no audience. You know, it's like, it looks like the MLS these days, for God's sakes. I'm just kidding. Don't write me an email, please. I'm just Ooh. kidding. I'm just kidding. You're gonna, um, you're gonna have to touch your subject there, Neil. Don't worry. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> you're gonna have to do a swerve on that one. 
You're an uh, Arsenal fan, no? I'm not an Arsenal fan. No, I'm a Man City fan. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, right. You're City, City all the way. Um, so you're happy. Yeah, I, have so you're you happy noticed the last last Saturday's result then? <laughs> have you noticed that the uh, level of play in the Premier League has gone down since the audience hasn't been there? Play, play in what respect? I just think the intensity has gone. I mean, it's still there, but it's far, far lower. And I think there's a lot of bonehead plays that before, you know, the audience would have been like, what are you doing? Kevin De Bunye? why'd you pass it? Like, you know, and so they get, oh, well, hold on. I, I just think it's oh, amazing to me. They haven't got the kind of the, the interaction with the crowd. and it's, it's not, The interaction with the yeah, crowd, yeah, one. Yeah. Two, the drive has been just yeah. not, you know, people are kind of playing for themselves. I see a lot of people... Uh, a lot of players in the league watching their ankles, you know, oh, I don't want to get hurt. Mm -hmm. Um, Where I think before with an audience interaction, it's it's just a different intensity. I think it's more intense. And I think it's more, people are a bit more accountable for their actions on the, on the field. And I I don't know. It's interesting. So I think the researchers will look at all of this stuff that's going on now and find some amazing insight. I'm not really sure what we'll uncover. Mm. What What do you you think? You've got got David Beckham down down the road now in in Miami doing the MLS something. Yeah, we got Bex. Oh, you got Bex. Bex. (laughs) That's right. Here we got him. I don't think he's playing anymore, right? He's just like a manager, right? Yeah, but he, he can still, you know, he can probably still not want him from the, from the kind of the opposite. Oh yeah, he'd, he'd be the best player in the MLS <laughs> if, he decided, <laughs> if he decided to put on a pair of boots. Exactly, exactly. So, um, yeah, no, so I mean, I, I saw one of, the, so one of the questions I got for you, because I was actually going to, I actually got a nickname for you now, actually, because of your, your history in, uh, on the West Coast and obviously now on the East Coast. I was going to call you Walt. Why? Well, you know, creativity, you know, you're in the center of creativity with Walt Disney World. Yeah. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> and, and obviously, because of your backstory in LA, which I know you're going you're gonna to cover now. Because I mean, one of the things I found incredible with your, your backstory was the kind of different place you've been to and some, some legendary organizations that you've worked with. I mean, I mean could, could you just sh- share with some, some of the stories from, from your backstory? I mean, some of the, some of the, some of the peaks and some of the valleys. Well, there's lots it. of valleys <laughs> <laughs> and few peaks. Um, <laughs> You know, you, you learn more in failure than you do in success, although it doesn't feel like that at the time that you're going mm-hmm. through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's incredibly important to go through that failure. Um, yeah, I've, I, you know, so I started working in audio. I uh, was working with, you know, everyone from Rod Stewart to KRS-One and all these old hip-hop artists. And, you know, I, I picked, I cherry-picked a lot from that business. You would think that, in the creative field, quote unquote, movie, music, whatever, that, oh, that's where you'll find the recipe for creativity. It's not the case. You find parts of the recipe, but not the entire right. recipe. Right, right, right. Um, I found that there is a lot of people in Hollywood and in music that are alcoholics or drug addicts, and mm-hmm. they have been waiting for that lightning the big, bolt the big, to strike. The big break, the big break you know. Yeah, you know, the big break, the lightning bolt to strike, the, you know, the big sort of thing that'll happen to them so that they can, you know, become creative and and really embrace their craft. And those, you know, that's one subset of people. And those Mm. are the one hit wonders, the people you see, you know, they have that catchy tune, but can never replicate it. And then you have a whole host of other people a whole host of other people who have a predictable and readily repeatable routine of creativity. They, they have, you know, managed to get it into a rhythm. No mm. more than you or I could do. Uh, they're doing it. And, you know, does it take a gift? I mean, sure. Can you sing great? Yes. But you, you and I both know that when we turn on, you know, some pop music these days, you don't even need to sing right anymore. So some of these people 
uh, in music and in film just have a routine. They right. have a creative, predictable routine. So I've cherry picked some of that. Um, I've worked with, you know, brand from JetBlue to, to Microsoft to Suzuki and, and all these great brands. And I learned there a bunch of stuff to cherry pick from their creativity mm-hmm. uh, and their sort of construct of, of what makes really good um, creative venture. Uh, I ran a, a furniture refinishing business for a, a while and, you know, learned a lot about, you know, how furniture is made and how, you know, who is the buyer for a refinished piece of furniture that, you know, is reconditioned and so on and so forth. The eco right. factors there, there it, it's a big, it's a big niche of industry and there's a lot mm-hmm. of creativity to, to grab from that. And then onward and upward to different businesses and, and different products and services that I've been lucky to be a part of. And in every step of the way, Andrew, I've noticed that the people who are creative do really, really well. And the people that are not, they kind of like, you know, uh, get relegated into the, into the pages of history and become sort of irrelevant quickly. And I didn't want to be that. I really wanted to understand how to do creativity on a regular basis and, mm. you know, be able to cherry pick it from people that I've, I've admired. And right about then, about six, seven years ago is when the book came together because I felt like I had enough to write down a prescription, a right. recipe to mm. give it to people, hand it to people and say, go and become creative. Yeah, because I mean, I think also the thing I was going to say, like, like Pixar, you know, like the stuff that Steve Jobs did where he kind of completely came out of Apple and he went into something that was kind of an adjacent area, animation, yeah? And then built Pixar to be such a legendary company. Uh, yes. With the rest of them there. And, you know, it's a bit like, uh, you know, you, the thing you were saying about bit earlier about the rotation. You know, people would be, would be in a certain role in an organization, but if they have that, those human skills, those people skills, those creativity skills, they can traverse into different roles, Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, speaking for myself, I mean, I've done lots of different functional roles, but I've only, I've never, I've never been a finance director, but I've pretty much done all the other roles in the company. Me um, too. So I don't know, I, but I know some very good finance directors. <laughs> You're right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> were, yeah. Some it's some a bit crazy and some of them are a bit, bit more straight, you could say. So, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me about it. It's really create. So I'm not advocating for your listeners to completely abandon the analytical side, right? I get that a lot. Near the analytical side got me to where I am. I have this many employees. I have this much uh, in in you know um, equity. I have this many trucks and three buildings and 18 different locations. Whatever it is. I don't advocate for people to get rid of that, um, Andrew. I advocate for people to add to it. We yeah. have been functioning on half of our performance forever. We have been functioning on half of our ability, half of our potential for far too long. It is time to unite both parts of the mind together mm. to just do way, way, way better in what we are trying to do. Way more, um, you know, nimble, way more creative, way more innovative. Um, you're, you're talking about extracting way, way, way more revenue out of, uh, way more pot- profit out of revenue. You're looking at different areas of the business and saying, what can I do to become better at this area? And how do I tweak things? I've tried the spreadsheet logic. I've tried the analytical approach and we're, you know, we're a quarter of a percent here, eight, you know, 0.08% over there of efficiency. We've Mm -hmm. run out of ideas. What do we do now? And Mm -hmm. that's when I advocate creativity. It's really about using a different port, part of your mind and a different way of thinking and even framing the problem can add creativity, you know, just asking a question in a different way and looking at the problem in a different way that we've become uh, conditioned to, especially through business school can yield amazing creative results. So I suppose one of the things that 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 kind of triggers in my mind, because I've mentioned a couple of icons in my mind is like Walt Disney, Steve Jobs, you know, I think I kind of, I don't know, well, I don't know. Uh, my question was going to be, uh, do they, are they seen as creative icons, would you say? Or, um, Absolutely. Uh, and, and I suppose if those are seen as creative icons, then who are the, you know, you know the analogy of when you were, when you were, you know, younger, you looked at your 
in your bedroom you had the post your poster of your favorite rock band or your favorite pop band yeah the, the poster childs as i call you call it so who who would you say apart from yourself obviously <laughs> uh, are, are the um, creative icons you know that have, have really to my mind embraced what you're saying and what what your mantra is and what you're uh, what you're really you know you, you're putting you're plugging somebody in saying you, you're giving them a jolt you're saying give them give yourself a, a creativity jolt who who are the icons for you i think you have you've named a few already you know you have uh, elon musk you can add to there mm. you have um the uh the guys who run amazon and and so on and so forth you have a lot of companies out there um that are embracing parts of the of creativity and some like like elon companies all of them um do really really well but andrew what i'm really excited about is not the poster child i'm excited about the day-to-day -day user right um it's the dry cleaners over here in Orlando that does a, uh, you know, an, a monthly lump sum. Bring as many stuff as you want, you know, bring as much as of your clothes or whatever you want to bring in. It is this much a month. That's a brilliant model, right? So 80% okay. of the time they're going to do well and 20% of the time they're going to lose money. I'm sure they get the lady or the guy who comes in every day, you know, just to do it. You know, I'm getting my money's worth, you know, or I'm sure that happens, mm -hmm. but that's a brilliant model to me. It's a clothing store that is out um, here by me that, you know, uh, has quarterly events. You know, it's a small, this is a small business, but it's wonderful. They have quarterly events where they, you know, you, there's booze and, and music and people show up and have a good time, but you can't buy anything that night. Yeah. <laughs> Not one sale. Right? So people go and, yeah, this is cool. And they kind of let their guard down. And they look around. Well, I, I kind of want this. And oh, that looks pretty good. That would look good in my living, you know, so on and so forth. And then, you know, the day after they're flooded with sales and, mm. and, and that kind of thing. It, like it is. Bit like anticipation. Because you, re, yeah. you, you I mean, that example with, with my retail buyer, you're kind of rethinking retail. You're kind of making it a, a social event. Whereas usually, usually you go into a store to buy something, but you just kind of, you're browsing, but then with, with some kind of also the rewards. I see it's kind of rethinking it. Yeah. That's, that's the creativity that I love to champion, you know, at every point at every sort of milestone of human history, there had been somebody who said there's nothing new anymore. Everything's already been invented. There's nothing changed. You know, everything's already been done already. There's no point in reinventing. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing to me how many people believe that kind of logic. They say, Nir, I'm in retail. Retail has been established for 140 years. And I say, baloney, it's not been established for 140 years. It's up to you to redefine it, to change it based on your, on your personality. I worked for a mid cap. Uh, I consulted for a mid cap company. Um, that manufactured things. Uh, they had a few government contracts and they were like, we're in the business of buying really nice machines, customizing them to make parts. That's what we do near. And I'm like, I'm not so sure. Right. So I flew around, I did the, did the different, uh, um, different staff, different leadership. And, um, the more that I learned about these guys, the more I found that they were really in the trust business, their contracts, hired them specifically because yeah they had the machines or whatever but they really hired them because they trusted them they right. trusted them over and over and over again yeah. in parts that were critical to a certain portion of uh aerospace mm -hmm. and that meant that the mindset um was able to be shifted to a more creative mindset where I help them understand what being in the trust business really means. Mm -hmm. And then what different touch points that we can kind of tweak, Re alter, reinforce the trust piece I, I, to reinforce that across the line so that when we get to the opportunity of a new bid, uh, to the opportunity of a request for proposal, mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth, the RFPs, were written in different ways. They were now in, mm -hmm. in a mode of storytelling. They used to be legal documents. I was like, forget it, <laughs> forget yeah. it. It's like the old, the old MSA sort of uh, right. uh, um, thing I was telling you about earlier. I was like, guys, let's tell stories. You know, they're like, no, we're not. This is going to, you know, X, Y, and Z company. These guys are, you know, blue chip sort of, we can't, I was like, yes, you can. Let's start telling stories. You guys are in the business mm -hmm. of trust. And mm -hmm. we started to develop it 
and, and really that identity didn't come from me, uh, Andrew. It came from, it came from the fabric of, of who that company really was and what they really did and, and what gave leadership a lot of pride. Um, you know, very low failure, 99%, you know, uh, um, efficiencies and and uh uh you know very 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 low failure rate very very high tolerances doesn't matter what you do andrew you can be in manufacturing like, you like can the be philo in philosophy or the principles behind the the promise the customer promise that's exactly right and understanding what those are at every touch point mm. it can yield amazing creative and amazing profitable potential yet you know this is not what you learn in business school you know you learn all of the analytics in business school it's yeah. time for us to get the message out for me to get the message out to people to say that there's a different way to do it and you've already maxed out i'm not going to come in and tell people oh yeah let's you know let's get better at the analytics they, listen there's people that are a million times smarter than me working on that end. They've developed their mind so well that they can look at numbers and, and assess things and find beautiful threads of logic and that's fantastic. That's not me. I am there to help them think in a different way and I want your listeners to be able to think in a different way. I believe the potential that we have on that side is incredible and yet we all wonder why we can't get to the next level. We're we're literally driving a car with a half tank of gas, wondering why we can't arrive, wondering why we can't get to where we're going. And so I want to help people mm. fill up the tank a little bit more. Yeah, so I think so on that point, so I, I probably went, yeah, so what you're saying is I went down the wrong avenue by saying who are the poster childs and who are the icons because everybody knows about those guys. It's what you're saying is your mission is to level up, is to basically say, look, let's, let's get, a billion people to be more creative that's is that is that kind of where your mission's going now uh, oh 100 percent. and who benefits you and i and, and honestly it's a bit of a selfish goal andrew like i want so what we have in medicine just for example for example and i write about it in the book hmm. we have a researchers that are brilliant I mean, I'm talking brilliant. They read stuff that's even unpublished. You know, it's like like peer-reviewed stuff that nobody and and they're detailed in there and researched from across the world. Right, amazing stuff. Yet, when they're working on a particular problem, oh, let's say curing cancer. Right, they are hesitant to release something. They mm. put their ego in place of that. They uh, are worried about their reputation. You know, what right. are people going to think if I take this leap of faith on this right. certain thing? But mm -hmm. creativity assures you that you must take the leap of faith on that thing. You must fulfill that sort of destiny um, and it's okay to fail. So mm -hmm. what we have is, a, is inside of medicine, especially, but in many fields, we have a failure culture that doesn't like to fail. Why? It's obvious because they don't want to kill people. I mean, you know, when you fail in medicine, the stakes are very, very high. But I argue that if we don't start understanding that we need to get a little bit better at failure and understanding failure, not to mm. the level of lethal uh, failure, but, mm. you know, it's okay to do an experiment that you think is way out there if it's going to save lives. And we see that over and over again in every business. You have it in aerospace. I've worked with manufacturing and that in that field, um, Andrew, you know, we could have easily have put a woman on Mars by now, easily. But you have an engineer sitting there who loves this stuff. They live, eat, and breathe it. And they're like, you know what? I I've got an idea about this thing, and it'll push the spacecraft 8.8 .8 miles faster or whatever, cumulative. It'll get us to Mars four months earlier. But it's such a far out there creative type idea that they don't want to be seen as the wacky person who comes up with that too far out there idea and I've worked hard to develop my reputation and this and that. So I feel like, yes, we need to get a billion more people creative and lift the quality of life for most people on earth. But is that, is that, is that, is that, you know, that engineering example you just gave there, is that because of the mindset is that they've got some constraining beliefs about the, the impact, you know, they're not, they're playing safe basically. That's what you're saying. They're not. No doubt. You're Listen, not, you're, you're you've gone to the finest schools, okay? You've graduated MIT, 
okay? You're going to work for, let's say NASA, or you're going to work for uh, Elon Musk, right? And you're sitting there, you've worked your whole life to get there. You mm -hmm. have, you, you know, a husband yeah. at home with two kids. You're, you're stressed out, man. You know, you have to get it right. You, you've gotten this far. You're feeling pretty good. Everybody around you is from NASA, right? They're from mm -hmm. the shuttle program from 2011. Right. And, you know, and, and, yeah. and I, I don't want to give too many specifics away, but let's say, let's say this happens, right? And you're sitting in that room and you're wondering like, okay, I've got some really great ideas. What are you going to do, Andrew? Are you going to execute them or are you going to kind of fall in line and start developing your career and developing your reputation? 99.99999% of people are going to do that. Very, very few people are going to take the risk, but we need right. people to take that risk. We need it because it benefits yeah. society. Listen, there has been no system on earth ever created, ever before us, that has lifted more people out of poverty than the free enterprise system that we practice in the West. It touches so many lives and so many different points of the, of the globe that are seemingly unrelated. But when you look at the big picture, it's amazing how much connectivity we have to what we do. And it is my job to empower people who work, whether they're employees on a career path or whether they're owners or, or leadership of a business, it is my responsibility, I feel, it is mm. my responsibility to educate those people on a thing that they're completely uneducated in, which is creativity, and allowing sort of the creative mindset, the creator mindset, to mm. take over and, uh, and have different manifests of what it offers. You know, risk aversion, help. It offers uh, help to just go and, and do something that you think is interesting. It offers help to people who are stuck. It offers help to people who want to dream big and mm -hmm. go big. Yeah. So there's incredible potential there that we are untapped in, yeah. and I want to uh, bring it forward. We like unleash the creativity, unleash the creative. Literally. Yeah. So, so my question, well, my challenge to you would be, I suppose, if you said, you know, maybe this is being a bit, a bit out there, but, you know, say if you could, it could impact a billion people, yeah, 100 million people, a billion people. How, you, how you, you know, you, you're writing this book, which sounds like amazing. I'm going to buy it when you get it, when you get it out there in the next few hours. Um, but are you going to do a masterclass? Are you going to do a mastermind? You know, how, how, you know in, these, in these kind of these, these things where, you know, we're all living online in this kind of weird kind of world at the moment. Um, I just feel that, you know, it's how do you equip people? Or how do you, how do you scale it? You know, how do you get it out there? Is, is that, have you got some ideas around that? So the book is part of it. And um, I'm talking with the uh, people now to potentially do a, a master class, so on and so forth, develop the message, build it and get it out there so that people can use it. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there, uh, a lot of, um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, sort of things that I'm working on to to kind of propagate that mess. Yeah, no yeah. doubt, no doubt. Because I mean, there's, there's loads of companies that I'm working with that um, you know I think could benefit from that type of approach because I think you do people get used to that pattern, yeah. And if they've got some success, then they kind of just you know it's like rinse and repeat. They kind of just do the pattern. They don't really step back and think, ah, right, should we do it differently? I mean, you know, just yes, we talked about today. I'm thinking about some of the business I'm working in. Okay, let's get. You know, I want to understand these tools and work out how we could apply them into some of the business I'm working in. Because it's absolutely um, the finance fintech seems to see a lot of what worked yesterday will work tomorrow type logic. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen that in that the uh, financial technology sector quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, it's really a destructive sort of philosophy, to be honest. Um, look at all these people, you know, that said, oh, tomorrow will be the same as today. And then COVID hit. You need, it's no longer an option to kind of, or a nice to have. Hey, let's, let's, let's have some great ideas. It's, it'll be nice to have. We'll use it one day. Um, I think the operational sort of positioning of companies today relies on you having multiple plans and uh, if you're not thinking creatively you're going to get stuck look at all these companies that are doing great right now great and look at all these companies that are doing horrible there's far far more more of them than the ones that are doing well and I feel that 
if those companies had generated creativity at every touch point throughout the organization, the sales pipeline, hiring, um, you know, um, management, finance, every single operation, every single part of the construct of the company, if they're already thinking creatively, then they could easily sort of change mm. position and, and move forward. Um, so what, so I'm what, reminded of a company that that uh, you know makes kind of uh, booths so that people can sleep in in an airport. You know they they're like small little booths and you know you pay like a dollar or two dollars or whatever you can sleep in it for half an hour and then you know you kind of put a sheet down. It's like a sanitizing thing and so on and so forth. You know those guys were creative. You know they they're manufacturing the whole. The whole organization took that and literally just tweaked it a little bit. Now they're selling home offices, right? So you, right. you get a little, you know, hey, I've got a mm. piece of yard. You put the thing in, it's 25 or 40, I don't know, 50 square feet or however big it is. It's tiny. But, you know, people are ordering them now for their house because they're, you know, I don't want to be at home all day on, on Zoom calls. I'd rather have an office to go to and want right, to return. Right. It, it's that kind of stuff that I love. I love that type of thinking. And the moment that we stop thinking creatively about what's next is the moment that we get stuck in and possibly go out of business. So, I mean, what, so what, one of the things we've been talking about for obviously the last period of time is, is we've been talking about, because what you're saying is the creativity not only stimulates your personal growth, but also will stimulate your business growth. Because that example there where you, that company pivoted, you got like pivot, you know, you pivot slightly into to building new products and bring it out to market. Is that does that does that make sense? Is that is that's that's what you're seeing as a big driver of the future? A absolutely, absolutely. In in part of that is why everything that I talk about is free. It really is shifting your mindset to taking sort of what you have and organizing it in the best way for when a crisis will hit. It's not if something it will hit, it's when. And if it's not a pandemic, it's a economic crisis. If it's not mm -hmm. an economic crisis. It's a hiring for crisis. I remember uh, three or four years ago working with companies that couldn't get kids out of school. They relied on getting kids, really good kids out of school, and they couldn't get those kids because other companies came in and took the cream of the crop, and they had the right. next level, and they, they couldn't hire good people anymore. You know, near we can't get good people. What's going on? They raised the salary, you know, or the, all of these sort of analytical sort of constructs weren't working, and so – you know, it's not, people think of crisis as, okay, COVID, fine, it's a crisis. Um, but it could be a recession. It could be not finding the right people. It could be a supply chain breakdown somewhere. Um, so for me, it really is. <laughs> well, what you're talking about there is that in that example with the talent was, was or the, the hiring piece. It's a bit like, yeah. you know, my, my, my quick analogy would be, it's a bit like, okay, you've got a motorway with like 20 lanes, yeah? Let's create it. Let's create our own motorway with our own lane. Yeah. And let's put the foot down and boom, yeah, let's just go for it. So it's like, don't do what the pack does. Yeah. Do that's what, you, is that what kind of what else are you talking about? You kind of, no doubt, no rethink, doubt. Rethink the whole, the whole model, rethink right. our marketing, rethink how we hire people, rethink how we deal with the whole customer journey and then use that, tap into creativity and, and use that by tapping into people's creativity of the individuals and, and upskill them on these tools as well. Exactly. Creativity is something that can be learned. Anybody can learn it. It just takes the will to do so. And the benefit of doing so is not, you know, um, sort of a get rich quick scheme, you know, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but everything in my book is not, you know, uh, about, you know, five minutes to a million dollars. It's not about that. It really isn't. It's about work. If you're looking to get rich quick, don't buy my book. Yeah, it's that, just that, not your book cover. You might, might get some more sales. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about, you know, there, there are hundreds of thousands of books out there. If you Google it now or whatnot, that'll promise to get you rich by the end of this week. Okay. This is not that book. If you're looking for that, don't don't come here. This is not that book. This is about getting better and and reorganizing the way that you look at things and mm -hmm. rethinking every facet of your business to get better. It's just not an overnight thing. Yes, you're going to see results, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. You know, these, this is a, a lifetime of development into mm -hmm. creativity and understanding how creativity can grow your business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what, that's what I was talking about. It's like life skills. You're teaching people life skills that they can traverse into different industries, different roles, 
you know, their whole life. They can basically apply these things it's like your toolkit. You're giving them a toolkit of how to be. No, no doubt. That's exactly what this book is. And I'm not really teaching them how to do these things. I'm teaching them to remember how, what their creativity is telling them to do. We did a study and we found out that babies are creative before even language sets in. When they look at something, they solve a problem in a way that can only be creative. It really is. It's in the book. And so what I want to do is reawaken that potential. The way that you're going to solve problems, Andrew, and the way that I solve problems is completely different, right? Mm -hmm. You are... Uh, you know, you were born in Manchester and, you know, you guys lived in a, you know, uh, a 1700 castle and you had, you know, 7,000 <laughs> acres of land. You know, you're, 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 you've just started yeah, differently. Of, lots of servants and things like that. You got yeah. servants, right? Fine China. I, you know, I was, you know, born in, in Israel and raised in, in Los Angeles. I was in a one bedroom apartment forever with five people, the way that I'm going to solve problems because of my background, because of my history and because of who I am, is going to be completely different than the way you solve problems. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to a company, you're, you know, you're going to in your company say, you know what guys, let's build another lane. I'm tired of the 20 lane. I'm going to let's build our own lane literally and then right. go. And then I'm going to say, why are we building lanes? Let's get a helicopter and it will just take you where you need to go. That's the beauty of creativity. Depending on the person, it will be different. And I want to unlock that latent creativity that everyone has so that they can go and solve problems the way that they need to. Just, just, to crush, just to crush your image of me, right? I actually did, my first job was actually sweeping the floor in a, in a very famous UK retailer, which no longer nice. is called Woolworths. Get in there. Woolies. I actually swept the floor every day. Yeah. Nice. And then I used to, on the Saturday, I used to be a Saturday lad and I used to sell computers, you know, like sell sell Commodore Pets and Sinclair Spectrums on a Saturday. Wow. Was, I, was the, I was the computer geek. But then on, during the day, I was, I was you know, in the, rubbish, in the rubbish bins. I was sweeping <laughs> the floor. Um, and then I ended wow. up running a, a mobile company that worth a few billion pounds. So, you know, it's amazing what you can do. So, um, you know, How you're far not, you've come. You're not the only one that's, that's had an interesting background. Don't worry. <laughs> right, right. No, I mean, and, and most people do. You know, most people have amazing impetus. You know, they'll tell you, you know, when I was seven years old, my grandma told me such and such. And it changed my life. You know, I was seven. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we were... I, listen, people tend to think, right, that because you're rich or you're poor or however you were bought up, you mm -hmm. know, oh, if you were poor, you have way more to take from. But that's not the case. I've met several people who have come from very, very uh, uh, robust means who mm. have completely different problems, you know, than, than, you know, somebody who I, who came from very modest means. There mm. is no right. There is no wrong. There mm. is really only the raw material that we carry around with us that we yeah. can learn from. And sadly, Andrew, I don't know why we do this. I just, it's so frustrating. And that's why I wrote this book. And that's what I've dedicated my life to doing is sort of saying, okay, fine, we're good at that. But why have we ignored this whole other half of our potential? And mm -hmm. how do we use it every day? Fantastic. I mean, so my, one of my final questions I've got for you was about um, the, I suppose that the T in te te in te the G and T, yeah, the T in technology, yeah. So, what any any kind of sound bites or view on on technology? Are you scared about the future? Are you are you kind of encouraged about the future? Do you see some things coming down that are going to be amazing? Or what? Any any view on that? So, I talk in the book a lot about technology and its detriment to creativity. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yes, um, I believe that. Uh, and we, we had some very decent research in here. Um, you know, I believe that AI and all these things can never, ever, ever approach mm. what a human being can do creatively when we want to do it mm. um, and if we want to do it. I, I think a lot of the AI that exists today is amazing. A lot of technology that exists is amazing. Mm. But I think it lull, most of it lulls us into comfort. And comfort is something that kills creativity because uh, it's something that is hardwired into our brain. Here's the thing, right? 
50, 60, 70,000 years ago when we were living in caves, right? We had to be comfortable. If we weren't comfortable, we weren't alive. So we found a water source and it was right by the cave. And why would we ever move, right? There's water, there's a cave, they're 25 meters apart. Let's stay there forever. Why would we ever move? And that kept us alive quite literally to, to like the ripe old age of 22 or something. I'll talk about it in the book, dude. We died <laughs> super young back then. It was crazy. I mean, you know, like 26 well, was like grandpa at, age. You could die at 22. Oh, it was something like that. Really? Like 50, 60. Oh, but yeah. I it got eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so I believe that those same constructs that kept us by the watering hole mm. are now keeping us by our phones. Right. It's the same thing. It makes no sense. Mm. But yet, you know, we're, we're so in love with these things and we kiss them and we love them and we, mm. we sleep. Some people sleep with their phones, man. It's it just <laughs> it's crazy how close we are to this because it taps into something that we were connected to when we were younger. I advocate for a stop of this connection and a rekindling of the creative portion of the mind mm. to be able to solve problems better. I talk about going on text detox in the book and, right. you know, shutting off okay. your phone and really disconnecting from an app to solve problems for you when you can solve problems for going, you. Go, like going off the grid and going back to basic human interaction and, you know, you know kind of working with teams and doing those kind of those I mean, a little bit. Yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not advocating to horse-drawn carriages or something like that, <laughs> you know, or or that sort of thing. Um, these are incredibly useful, but we're we need to use them a little bit better. We mm. need to learn how to use our technology a little bit better. Um, I am not on the bandwagon that technology is the end-all, be-all, and it's going to save everyone's soul from, you yeah. know, I, I completely do not believe that. Yeah. And I, I do not believe that artificial intelligence will take over. Yeah, sure, there's some remedial jobs that it'll take over. But mm -hmm. I asked, why were you doing that job in the first place? Did mm -hmm. you come up with a better idea? I mean, you know, you're... The yeah, why, why you do, do yourself out of the job by being totally, fun. you yeah. know. So, so it's that kind of thing. That's my outlook on technology. I think it's incredibly useful when used correctly. Mm. So, so I suppose as, as a, a way of kind of wrapping up this episode, because I know you, you're a busy boy and you've got to you launch tomorrow. Um, what, what, what would be the I suppose kind of takeaways? What, what are the kind of the key takeaways and, and lessons learned you would want to share with people listening to this episode today? Because I think it's been a fantastic episode. And I, I think it's some. It sounds like there's some really big jewels and gold dust in your book that people are going to really get some value out of. I suppose what would be some ones that you, you, you kind of emphasize or amplify? So I would like your listeners to know two very important things, okay? One is that creativity is deeply held within all of us, no matter who you are or no matter what you do. Stop thinking creativity is being able to play the trumpet or painting a really great picture. Creativity is not art. Art is but a 1% tiny, tiny sliver of the construct of creativity. It is how we're introduced to it and it's what we think that creativity is, but it's not. I want your listeners to understand that we're all born creative mm -hmm. and that creativity is not art, okay? And then the second really most important takeaway that I want your listeners to understand is that when you know that you are born creative, you need to start listening to the gut that's telling you what you need to do. That gut is your ancestral creativity trying to quote unquote save your life and help you out and help you do what you need to do to get better and faster and stronger and more profitable and you know uh, uh, into new markets, so on and so forth. And so if we understand that we are all creative and we understand that we have a gut that's telling us what to do, we need to turn up the volume on that. I'm not saying listen to every one of your ideas. Some of them are going to be wacky, but you need to turn up the volume <laughs> so that you can at least start hearing these ideas again. Mm. And you need to turn down the volume on the analytical side right. and learn how to run your brain and run your, your human operating system as a harmonious unit. Listen, Andrew, I don't know what's going on in England, but here in the U.S., I mean, I know a little bit, but here in the U.S., we got 
you know, people on the extreme left. We got people on the extreme right. Nobody's talking. Everybody's yelling. The the thing is, we need more center these days. We need to come more to the middle of things. Mm. We need to literally do that. It starts literally within our brains. We need to learn how to operate in a more unified oh, oh, and right. balanced way. We have mm. to bring our thinking to a more balanced field. If we're able to bring our thinking to a more balanced perspective, a more balanced field, then there are no problems in our business that we won't be able to solve. Everything is solvable when you engineer the human mind to attend to problems in a creative and balanced analytical way. Fantastic. I mean, I think you definitely, definitely, I mean, I know it's been taking a long time for you to get here, seven year itch. Ha. Uh, but, but, you know, it sounds like, I mean, you're on something here. I mean, I think it's, 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 you know, the, well, I suppose the challenge here is let's get to a billion people impacted by your work. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the mission there. Yeah, I, I sure, I sure would hope so. You know, I want to get the that's, message. That's the BHAG. That's the BHAG here. Yeah. Yeah. No, no doubt. Um, we have a community. <laughs> yeah. We have a community on the on my webpage. It's nearbashan.com. Click on the community button. We've got you know some very interesting people in there asking very interesting uh, uh, questions oh, really? and answers. Yeah, it's kind of like a uh, like a moderated forum. You know, where you ask questions and you get help and you get different perspectives. It's okay. wonderful. We have everything from C-suite people in there to interns. Um, if any of this sounds good to you, I'd love to see you online. I'm, I'm, I poke my head around in there uh, ever so often. Um, just go to my website, nearbashan.com, click on community, and I'd love to hear what you guys think. No, it's fantastic. Is, I mean, is that, so I was just going to say. Is that, Completely is that, free, by the way. Free. <laughs> you heard it here first. Um, so, so it's, for people to get to try and get hold of you, that's that's the main the main way to get hold of you. Near Bashan's your actual website, yeah, that, yeah. That answers your Near Bashan world, and obviously you can you can get your book, you can get your masterclass in the future, your mastermind, yeah, and get access yeah, to the community. Definitely, there's three of us in the world, Andrew, three Near Bashans in the world, so you're more than likely going to stumble onto me. Although there's a Near Bashan <laughs> that that's uploading like video game clips. Uh, in Israel, uh, you know, and there's another one doing like a Fitbit challenge. So that's not me. If you see that, that's not me. We well, might be diversifying. You might be going to adjacent markets. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can just see you in the leotard, you know, doing all those kind of front press. Yeah, like uploading, uh, yeah <laughs> uploading video game clips. So thank you very much. That was Nir Bashan, author of The Creator Mindset, coming out tomorrow. Is that right? On the tomorrow. The 4th of August, 2020. You heard it here first, and this this episode will be uploaded today, as a, as in honor in honor of Nir. Uh, there we go. We'll post it on we'll post it on uh, on LinkedIn as well, so you can uh, you can feel, feel, listen to the episode, and uh, obviously then contact Nir through his website nearbashan.com. And wish you all the best with the book launch, and um, look forward to connecting in the future, and look forward to joining your mastermind, your masterclass in the future. It sounds fantastic. Thanks, Andrew. I, I really appreciate it. Can I ask you for your predictions for next year? City to take the league, or do you think Liverpool will do it again? Well, my son, my son Ben actually is a he used to support Man United, but he now supports Man City. So, um, okay, so he, no, so he that's a bit of a switch. No, sorry, he supports Man United, he now supports Liverpool, so to say, uh, from okay, after, after the kind of David Moyes kind of episode. And, um, he now told Put me your the, tongue, he told me the other day that actually, because I was teasing him, saying, you know, obviously that, that you know, City's going to come back and take, let's take it next year. And he goes, no, no way, no way. And I said, well, I, I said, well, I've heard that Jurgen Klopp is leaving. He's going to be the, come the manager of Man City. No, no, no chance, no chance, no chance. So this is, a, this is trying to show him a 16-year-old, you see, playing with his mind. There we go. But, um, yeah. <laughs> no, so I think, unfortunately, I think, I think Liverpool, it's taken 30 years to get the, the second premiership. So yeah. maybe... I think they might be on a roll now. That's the worrying thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's going to be interesting. The season starts in like, what, a month? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. I think we're going to see the most active transfer season ever. I think the money, the amount of money that will be spent on players now is going to be earth shattering. You, you know, because what you have a month or like five weeks, I think people are going to spend big money on unknowns, right? And like the, the gambling is going to be, oh, I love it. It's going to be I just, great. I just remembered actually, my final, final question for you actually is, is one question. You, you may be able to answer this, I don't know if you know. But what is, do you, do you drink gin and tonic? I do. 
Okay, so my question for you today is, because I've been doing this for my last few desks and I'm going to do it in the future as well, is what is your favorite gin? Uh, favorite gin? You know, I'm not, um, I'm not too snobby. I think, uh, <laughs> is, it, is it Bombay Sapphire? Kind of a middle, middle level? I think I'll take. Why, what, what's yours? What's mine? I think I, I think I, I mean, Monkey 47, the German one's very nice. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's just, I think this, the thing is, is there's a bar in, in London, uh, it's in Great Portland Street. It's got a thousand gins. I mean, it's just, it's just staggering. It's, it's built by a Spanish guy from Barcelona. It's oh, in nice. A, in the Melia Hotel, if you ever go to Great Portland Street. And um, it's just absolutely amazing. And they teach you how to do, you know, all the different drinks. And there's, there's, they're all there with the waiters, you know, with kind of very, very nice. Oh, cool. Um, but yeah, Monkey 47 is probably my, my favorite at the moment. It's, I mean, it's a classic. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's uh, somebody who came on the show the other, the other month and they had a rhubarb, they drunk rub, live rhubarb gin and tonic during the episode. Maybe that's our future episode. You can have oh, a there we go. Bombay that sapphire and, and tonic. Right, yeah. There we anyway, go. Thank, thank you, thank you, Neil, very much for today. Thanks for having me, sir. And uh, have a great day and have a great launch of your book and look forward to catching up soon. Thank you. Deeply honored to be here and I appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.